So, the title of this video might sound a bit confusing at first, so I want to explain exactly what a pointless extra is, simply because calling something a lost art and a pointless something sounds kind of conflicting. Simply put, it's something in a game that has absolutely no bearing on the game in any way. But it's substantial in size enough that it's really interesting because most people never actually see it. We're talking about hidden things inside of games that may have hidden mini games or bonus content that is practically impossible to find. This does not include unlockables, mind you. Because unlockables come as a course of the game itself. Because if you have to beat the game 100% and you get this unlockable, that's something you could see by just playing the game through and through. But this is something that you may have played a game for years and years and never even encountered. But why am I calling it a lost art? Well, there are many reasons for that, but we'll go over those in a little while. First, I want to give some examples from retro games, mainly the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, where this sort of stuff was a lot more, well, for a lack of a better word, apparent in these games. So let's start with an example that's actually very close to home for me, because of the fact it's a game that I absolutely adore, and had something in it that I didn't know about for many years. So the Rayman 2 Pong minigame. Honestly, I'm baffled that this sort of thing even exists. And this is exactly the reason why I wanted to bring this type of stuff up. Because this is so interesting to me. I played this game for many years since I was a kid. This is my absolute favorite game of all time. Maybe not my favorite version. That's still pending. That's a, that's a story for a different day. On specifically the PlayStation 2 version of this game, in the level of the Iron Mountains, there's a point where you get down a river through some rocks, you know, standard 3D platformer gameplay, and you land in a hot air balloon. But then you get a little transition screen, and it's like, oh cool, I'm soaring through the air. But that's all this screen has. It just loads, transitions, and then loads again. Kids playing the game aren't going to think anything of that. But if you actually press square and circle rapidly 15 times, it unlocks Pong, or more specifically, the Shblong, or Chaplong, depending on what spelling it has, because it has two. This, this is fascinating. Like, it's Pong. It's, it's so simple. And all I can possibly imagine is that some bored developer was like, okay, I'm going to add Pong. Does even the people who made this game outside of like the probably one person who made this even know this exists? So the, the, the bars on the side. Those are the health bar, right? Just vertically switched, so no new asset. The little ball is one of the icons you get in the UI at a certain point in the game. And of course, the rest of it is just text, and the background just comes from where you were. This exists solely from reused assets, and I love this type of stuff. This is the main reason I want to make this type of video, because we don't see this specifically as much uh, anymore. But we've got plenty more examples in this type of front. However, I do want to say about something about this particular thing that I didn't even really notice. I knew about this, but I didn't notice this particular part until very recently, where as it's like loading, you could say, it says Rayman is on a killing spree, which is just a really cool reference like to another thing. And that's super cool. And while I think this is one of the coolest examples, for me personally, obviously because, you know, favorite game, hidden thing I didn't know about, I still got plenty more cool things I want to talk about. So let's move on to the next one. The two hidden levels of Crash Bandicoot 3 may be very well documented nowadays, but I cannot imagine the first couple of people who found about these levels, how they must have felt when they experienced them. So let's go over both of them in order in terms of difficulty to find them. The first one is Hot Coco. You enter the level Road Crash, which is level 14, and it's a racing level. You know, driving away, you don't think much about it. You think, oh, you sign posts, sign things in the background, big billboards, race to the finish, come first, break all the boxes, standard crash stuff on vehicles and all that. However, one signpost in this level specifically is an alien signpost. And if you hit that, instead of, you know, like every other signpost in the game where it just gets knocked over, Crash instead stops in place, gets warped into a brand new level. 
And what's honestly confused about this part more specifically is that there's a secret level in the sixth warp room called Area 51. You know, alien stuff people talk about. Like. And there's even UFOs in that level, but instead you get brought to Hokoko. So I assume maybe that was like a swap around thing because there was too many water ski levels in the main game. Possibly. But it might also have to have something to do with the fact that Hot Coco is clearly... Now, I've got no evidence to back this up, but I'm saying this from my own game dev perspective. Hot Coco is clearly a dev test level. Because it is a big circular area, unlike any of the other jet ski levels, or hell, any other crash level, really. It's one big area with a bunch of obstacles and different patterns for stuff scattered around. The exit is right at the entrance, and it's covered by nitros. And the only way to get rid of the nitros is to go around the island and find the nitro dedication gate. What? Nitro detonation crate. Yes, I can English. So, you might be thinking, okay, well, that's simple enough. Yeah, try doing it on time trial, though. <laughs> it's, it's so difficult. It's so precise. This was clearly not planned as one of the levels, and that's fine. It's still super cool. Like, test levels, that kind of stuff? I love that kind of stuff. It's all assets from other levels, but it's still cool. Like, it's still an interesting idea to include that. But way more fascinatingly, apart from Hot Cocoa, is the other level, Egipus Rex, in which you enter into level 11 of the game. And once you have the yellow gem located elsewhere in the game, you can get onto the yellow gem path. Now you might be thinking, okay, yellow gem path, maybe there's a secret teleporter there or something like that. Yeah, that would be a smart idea, wouldn't it? How about try dying to the second pterodactyl, which normally all of them kill you, but instead this specific one takes you to another level? I am not making that up. That is genuinely how you get to that level. And it, once again, different type of level entirely. It's a 2D level with a dino. The dino you only really get in the 3D section. So this was a new idea that maybe wasn't like fully implemented. It's possible that this was just a cut level that they decided to re-implement. I don't know, honestly. I wouldn't say I'm not a Crash Bandicoot aficionado in some ways. I played a lot of his games and love them. Crash 3 was actually my first game. But... I can't guarantee if this level was meant to be in there or not. Point is, regardless of it, getting to it is is mind-boggling. Who thought of that? Whose idea? Someone must have thought, let's be cruel. And honestly, more importantly, how on earth did anyone ever find this level? Oh, I, 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 how did they do that? By pure accident, it must have been. Because I can't imagine any other way of that working out. However, there are more interesting examples. The next one in particular being one of my absolute favorite for a multitude of reasons. Spyro Freeze Anti-Piracy might be one of the most ambitious ideas I have ever seen in terms of this category of pointless extra. Now, I guess in this particular instance, this had a point to be, you know, anti-piracy. But keep in mind, they recorded new voice lines, added new dialogue, and new features specifically for this anti-piracy. And that is awesome! <laughs> so when you're going through the game, you know, after you get to a certain point, one of the characters tells you that you're actually playing on a legal copy of the game. It knows. It informs you. And that's kind of terrifying. <laughs> like, imagine you're a kid and the game tells you it knows. At this point, you might just turn off the game and be like, okay, that's it, that's, I'm done, that's, no, 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 no. But it tells you also that the game has been modified and you may experience problems that you might not experience otherwise. Yeah, problems is right. Because let me tell you, this game pulls no punches when it comes to its anti-piracy. Because it starts throwing out all sorts of tricks. If you make progress, for example, you know, having collected anything, it will at any given time just randomly delete your progress from that area. Like, oh, you got four eggs. Well, guess what? Those eggs are gone. And you want to see your atlas? I mean, you might be able to, sure. But don't worry, it will occasionally crash your game. Because <laughs> it was a pain in the ass to even get out of some areas because it kept crashing so much. I had to reboot the game like four or five times just in order to get it working. There's also plenty of other smaller crashes. For example, I couldn't even get to the options menu because it kept crashing. I don't even know if that's part of the anti-piracy, because I can't tell the game screws with me so much. There's also a very, very fun factor where the game decides, hey, how about we just make the camera spin constantly so you can't see what the hell you're doing? 
That was fun. Remember when the game started doing that to me? A on top of that, Moneybags reappears, reappears, many a times, and I couldn't even get most of the gems I needed to get for him because I couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> I didn't know what to do in some portions. Sometimes he just tries to extort money from you because he asks to open something, but it's already open! Because I already opened it before! Overall, this version of the game is basically impossible to play, and I've heard that it can also mess with your language settings as well, which I'm not sure if it ever did for me. I never really saw much of the text because the game kept crashing at certain points anytime text would be a thing, so maybe it did. I don't know. On other factors, even if you are insane and decide, hey, I'm gonna play for the entire game like this, guess what? When you get to the final boss of the game, it pulls out its final trick. <laughs> In which... Midway through the final boss, the game will just stop and start loading to the first area of the game. And once it loads, your progress is gone completely. Save file deleted. <laughs> This is by far one of the funniest anti-piracies I've ever seen. Now, there are other cooler kind of meta examples for anti-piracy I can think of, but in this particular case, this was like embedded into the game and apparently it actually worked. Like it stopped piracy in this game without having to really ruin the experience for main, like, you know, for, for people who are legitimate copy buyers. But let's head back to more, I guess, normal examples of this thing where people who actually buy a legitimate copy could also experience the uh, game. <laughs> In terms of smaller examples of this type of pointless extra, is Sonic Heroes with its two-player metal skins. Now, I do know quite a few people who already know about this, and you may say, well, that doesn't make it unknown. But to be fair, we're talking about when this came out. Because most people when this game came out would have absolutely no idea these type of things existed, because you would have absolutely no clue that they were even there. The metal skins are only found in Sonic Heroes by holding down a button while the loading screen is active. And this is interesting because it's a small example. It's a cute little tiny example for this type of thing. And you may say, well, I said at the beginning it had to be substantial in size to fit, but I have to appreciate these smaller things too because, well, these also are kind of cool. And while, of course, they don't look like Metal Sonic or anything like that, it's still interesting to see these different skins because someone, at least one person anyway, had to go to the trouble of adding these that they knew, probably, most people would never encounter. Or who knows? Maybe it was mandate to add it. Maybe it was specifically that they couldn't launch the game without it. But I very much doubt that since I'm sure at launch, no one knew about these. And while there isn't too much to say on these particular metal skins, I must say I am fascinated by how cool they look. Like, they look different, and sure, they just basically look like robot edge versions of the characters, but still, it's a nice little extra that someone went out of their way to add, and for that I must appreciate it. As a quick side note for some of the upcoming examples, specifically the next three, I did have to get some footage from other channels simply because of the fact that they are much further in the game and I didn't have any sort of save file nor real means to spend that much time getting to them just to show a small amount of footage. So I'll give credit in the video and also in the description for each of these channels. And of course if there's any problems with the examples being used, someone tell me, please. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, moving on. Crash Bash is a very interesting example because it's a party game that also features a completely unique single player campaign. Where, okay, granted, yes, it is just simply the party mini games given to you in each warp room one after the other. But it almost feels like this game was designed to be played for the single player campaign. However, it also comes with a co op feature. And I honestly gotta say, it's pretty fun when you play for co op. Not so much for single player though. But, the whole game's story based around the idea that Uku Uku and Aku Aku are fighting it out, duking it between good and evil. So they have different people represent their teams. So, obviously, naturally, there's a good and bad ending. Or, I guess more specifically, a good and evil ending. But what happens if one player is good and one player plays an evil character? The answer, a wholly unique level where you duke it out. And that is the example we're using. Because they could have just said, 
good by default or evil by default or whatever they wanted to do they, but they decided to have a whole little event where you two have to then duke it out after paying co-op the entire game and that's really cool like it's really fun to see that kind of thing come to life you know like like you have to co-op together the whole game and suddenly it's like oh now your teamwork is tested or more specifically your teamwork is now against each other <laughs> And while the arena you fight in isn't exactly something that's like super hard to make, I'm sure it didn't take too long to make it, the gesture goes a long way to feel unique and interesting. And yeah, no, it is an example of just the Crash Bash minigames, like Crash Crush, I think it's called, or Crash Crunch. Crash Crush sounds better. Crate Crush, that's it. Crate Crush, I'm not insane. And of course, as you'd expect, whoever wins this minigame decides the ending. So technically speaking, you can actually then just load your save file, do the final boss again, and then do this part again, and get the other ending. Both endings in one playthrough. And that's pretty cool. And as an extra point, the background obviously being like the main space background where like some of the cutscenes take place, that's also pretty cool. Because we never really get to see that. Space isn't really a thing in this game outside of like one mini game, and even then, it's a space city. More like the future rather than space if anything. However, most of the examples I've given really have been coming from the 2000s era. So what about something really old? Like, for example, the 80s. Let's see what we've got. Super Mario Bros. Of course, the 80s, one of the earliest examples in terms of gaming. I mean, I guess the new era of gaming, obviously arcades, Atari, and all that kind of stuff, but home gaming! This, this is a great example of a pointless extra in the terms of the warp zones. Because you might be thinking, most people nowadays obviously know about the warp zones, but think about back then, people. It wouldn't have been known until someone accidentally stumbled across it. Or someone got a little bit too daring and thinking, hey, I can get over the exit here. And that's exactly what they wanted. And honestly, I think it's really cool that in one of the most bizarre examples here, you could actually go into the UI. Like, you go in front of the UI. There are very few games I can remember where you can go in front of the UI. And that's a really cute little thing. So, what do the Warp Zones do? If you don't actually know, they just teleport you to new levels. You can go straight to a World 2, World 3, World 4. Or World 6, World 5, or basically any world as long as the pipe is available for you. But this isn't actually the main point I want to make, because most people actually already know about the Warp Zones. And, until I was making this video and talking to one of my friends about the ideas of it, they told me that in Mario 2, specifically the Japanese version, there's actually a World 9 that exists, but only you only get to play it if you don't use any of the Warp Zones in that game. Since by the time Mario 2 came out, Warp Zones became more and more well known, people started using them and trying to find them. Of course, for a more difficult game like Mario 2, people decided, hey, let's use the Warp Zones. And so they never actually found out about the Secret World 9. And what's even cooler on top of that is that the Minus World's an entirely separate glitch that people encountered in the first Mario game they then went on to basically make World 9 based around the Minus World. That is like seven levels of thinking ahead. And all in a single year, basically. I mean, it wasn't that long after Mario 1 that Mario 2 came out. That's a lot of foresight and a lot of critical thinking that quickly. And honestly, it's maybe one of my favorite examples, but probably just right now, since it's kind of like new in my mind. Because I obviously knew about some of the examples beforehand, but this one's like a new one, which is like, whoa! And that's actually an interesting point. I want to know what other examples I don't know of. I want people to tell me what I don't know about these games. Because there are hundreds of games out there. Thousands. Hundreds of thousands, probably. And they all probably have something in them that I don't know about. And I want to know about these type of examples. So if you know anything about any sort of game that you like or you know that I might like, I don't know. Tell me. I want to know. Leave a comment, description, whatever YouTubers say. Tell me about them. I'm really interested. But for now, I want to move on to the last example that we have in terms of this retro area. Back to the 2000s, of course, because there aren't really that many examples to talk about yet in the 90s and 80s.
Now, this very well may be the juggernaut of this type of genre, or thing, I guess. The Pointless Extras Big Boys! The Insomniac Museum is a dev room, and a gigantic dev room at that. Games have been known to have dev rooms for a long time, and they're always cool to see, of course. But the Insomniac Museum is special in the fact that it is absolutely filled with this kind of stuff. There is so much stuff in this that is unbelievable. There is cut content, there is hidden dialogues, there is all sorts of things you can walk around and see, and it's so cool. All of it. It doesn't matter if you don't care about any of it. It's super cool to see how much type of stuff they put into this. Even as a kid, I was absolutely fascinated with this type of thing. Like, this type of thing specifically, with these, like, cut levels from different, like, mini games, these, like, custom content type stuff like this was always so amazing to me because of the simple fact that there was no need to include any of it but how do you actually get to this you might ask like well how, how where, where is it where do you go there's actually two places specifically in ratchet and clank 3 which is an example i'm giving here and this is where it becomes a bit complicated whether i include this on the list or not because in ratchet and clank 3 this is both a completely hidden thing, but also bafflingly the 100% unlockable. And that's why I was kind of hesitant to include it, but at the same time, it's such a huge dev room that I felt like I just needed to. You know, I needed to let people know that if they didn't know, I mean, they probably do know, but if they didn't know, know of it, please. <laughs> so you can either get every single trophy in the game, or you can go to a random teleporter hidden somewhere in a city at 3 a.m. Like, literally, actually 3 a.m. And guess what? It's open! <laughs> and of course, that probably plays into the fact that the, the Ratchet and Clank series was made by Insomniac Games. And Insomniac, obviously, you know, to do with staying up late, not being able to sleep, that kind of stuff like that. Insomniac, 3 a.m., makes sense to have it like that. And I honestly kind of wish that that was just the only thing it was. Because, well, the 100% unlockable thing is cool and all, and I appreciate that that's the thing, but it kind of takes away from the fact that if you can just find it, then you don't need to 100% complete the game. Or, if you already did find it, then complete the game 100%, you have nothing to show for it. So it's kind of baffling in that way. But still, I would never trade in this specifically for the entire world. This is so cool. There's so much cool stuff. And while it may be a gigantic example, it's also kind of interesting to note that this is the last one I'm going to be talking about in terms of retro examples. So, I guess now I should probably move on to why isn't this a thing anymore? Or, I guess in a sense, what do I mean by it being a lost art? There's a few major reasons. So let's go over them with chapter 2. So some of these examples might be a bit more obvious to people who are in the know-how in terms of gaming and, well, game development. But the first major thing to bring up is data mining, which if you don't know what that is, essentially it's just looking in the game files and taking them apart and seeing what is in there between the pictures, the music, sound effects, even sometimes the code in certain games' cases. But the reason why this is being brought up is because, well, many developers may not feel a need to try and put in some super secret thing that no one will ever see if someone can just look in the files and find it anyway. Or maybe they do put something super secret, but because of data mining, it doesn't end up staying secret for long. And you may be wondering, why is Undertale on the screen? Well, I mean, if you don't know that, then you probably don't know Undertale, because it's full of these types of things. It's full of all sorts of secret hidden little things that people were supposed to essentially find as they played the game. Like, specific people, random chance, that kind of stuff, you know. Which isn't something I would really consider a pointless extra, per se. However, it still creates a mystery and narrative in the head that basically people would collectively come together to be like, Hey, I saw this, and hey... I saw this! But when someone can look in the files and see all of it at once, the mood is ruined. And no one wants to know because everyone already kind of does. Just a quick editorial note here, I sound really aggressive towards data miners for some weird reason in this portion of the video, but I just want to clarify the fact that I don't actually dislike data mining, it's just the way it comes across because we're talking about pointless extras and hiding stuff. So yeah, I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that before, it sounded like I was just being terrible towards people who like to data mine. So, uh, love you everyone. Back to the video!
But there are ways to combat this type of thing, and of course, if you don't include specific things in the files, like not give everything away at once with the new age of digital downloading and updates, you don't have to include everything at once, and that is a way of combating it. But this feeds into example number four, so let's get back to example number two before we go too far ahead of ourselves. Yeah, so time crunch obviously would play a big factor into these. Because if developers don't have time to even finish the game they're working on, or they need to have big day one patches to make the game sometimes even work properly, they're not going to have the time to add these cool little extra things like this. Especially when there's stuff that people aren't going to see. Because of course games are filled with detail and all sorts of cool trinkets of that, if only a couple of people are ever going to see something that's like an entire mini game or an entire like extra level or an entire area, people nowadays aren't going to have time. Now, of course, that's not to say that developer time crunch has never existed before the 2010s because it's always existed. But games have become so much bigger in size now that you don't really get a chance to get to those type of things done in your game. Hell, even smaller developers don't get that chance, really. And that's what brings us on to our third example, because that's exactly what it is. Naturally, with a smaller development team, you can expect less content in a game overall. Now, that doesn't mean that a small development team can't make an awesome game. There are plenty of awesome examples of small development teams, or hell, even just one person making an awesome game. But, once again, the chance of making something that's substantial in size, has a lot of good content in it, and also something else that most people will never see, kind of unlikely. Now, prove me wrong on this one, because to be honest, I would love to know if some indie games actually have these types of stuff. Once again, comment, tell me, I, I, you know, it would be cool to see. Because I think that indies tend to have more bonus content, you know, that you're expected to see, you're expected to unlock or whatnot, but that's still cool content, don't get me wrong, of course. However, it is still unfortunate because this type of stuff has kind of fallen out of fashion. So less indie developers naturally are going to do it. I mean, even myself, I've got a game I'm trying to make right now called Vexation, Handcrafted Hell. Wishlist description, no, totally not a plug. I haven't really had a chance to have anything substantial put in it either, simply because I'm pretty much working solo. And I wish I could add some hidden stuff that most people will never see. That wasn't just to do with like, more story or whatever. Because that's where our fourth example leads, because hidden lore may be one of the biggest driving forces to what's changed this market specifically. Because it's no longer about the idea of having something hidden just for hidden sake, but now it's hidden for a very different reason. Now, naturally, of course, when we make something, we want someone to see it. That's expected. You know, most people are going to make something and they want like, hey, I want you to see what this is. So, of course, if someone's a very small team or, you know, they're trying to have a story that's got hidden elements to it, you want people to find it because you want people to understand the whole story, even if pieces of it are very well hidden. And sometimes games do do that, especially, as I said, indie games. And this change of direction to have the more hidden content of the game be lore-based is an interesting way to take it, but honestly, in my opinion, while it does help some games to actually rise to success, it unfortunately kind of gets away from the whole idea of having this extra content that's just designed to be stupid extra content. And I will miss it, of course. And will we ever see it again? Oh, definitely. Someone will make something, and they probably already have that I don't know about. But it's mainly considered a lost art to me because of the fact that between the four examples I've listed, there are many reasons why, in the nowadays, we just can't see it. Not that people don't want to include this type of stuff, because, as I said, even myself, I want to include this type of stuff, but I don't have the resources nor time to take the time to spend testing and making something like this in a game I'm making. Or sometimes it's even just trying to find the right spot to have it. Sometimes it can feel like you might break the immersion of a game if you try to put it in. But if it's not designed to be found by most players, does the immersion really matter? Didn't matter in Rayman 2. Didn't matter in Ratchet & Clank. So what do we do? Well, as I said, it's still here, but just in a different way between the hidden lore and that kind of stuff. 
So let's take a look at some examples which I would call the modern examples. How is it presented in the late 2000s and onwards to when this started to change? I think it's safe to say that everyone knows what Final Fantasy Freddy's is, or at least most people, but if you don't, it's a horror game in which you spend your time in an office defending yourself against animatronics that might come to your door. And the first one, made back in 2014, was just that. No real lore or anything to it. Unless, of course, you encountered some very specific secrets that can appear very specifically at certain times. And it was this type of pointless extra specifically that actually led to it becoming a gigantic success. Because while, yes, initially the gameplay is what hooked people in, it was these secret lore pieces that drew people to want to know more. And because of that, we now have a juggernaut of a franchise that still exists today. I mean, let's be fair here, FNAF is everywhere and has so many games you can't even count them at this point because they literally don't come with numbers anymore. But it's safe to say that if these hadn't been included, if they had just been, you know, left alone and no secret things or secret magazine clippings or whatever had actually been put into the game, we wouldn't have nearly as big a franchise as we did. Now we might have had a second game because of gameplay, but something tells me that it would have not gone in the same direction as it did. And so that explains why the change in direction happened. But this isn't the first example of something, in the newer era, to have hidden lore pieces, or I guess pointless tidbits, put into a game just for the sake of having it. Because here's an example from the late 2000s. What's interesting about Left 4 Dead 2 is that I probably wouldn't have even thought to include this on the list if it hadn't been for the fact that a couple of weeks ago I started playing this game again with my friends. And to be honest, we've had a crazy fun time playing it and it reintroduced me to the writings on the walls in the safe rooms. Now, for those who don't know the game, it's a very well put together fun game by Valve, who you very likely know from the people who made Steam, that involves four survivors fighting off against a zombie apocalypse in any way they can. But one kind of overlooked area that you encounter all the time is the safe rooms themselves. These are the checkpoints you encounter between each chapter in a campaign. Of course, you are meant to get supplies here, ready yourself up, and get ready to go again. But on the walls of these safe rooms exist little pieces of dialogue that people have left before. Obviously survivors who have either perished already or are out there somewhere trying still to survive. Now, sometimes these can tell sad stories of families being separated and trying to rekindle together. Or it could be something hilarious, like someone telling someone to shut up, or get lost, or someone saying something like, we are the real monsters, and then everyone basically dogpiling on them, telling them they're stupid. Which is kinda realistic. In this situation, if there was actually a zombie apocalypse, yeah, people would still be kinda mean to each other, let's be fair. <laughs> like, they still would, at any chance they could, in certain things like this. And I think it's really fascinating because these could have just been empty walls, because who would say otherwise? The whole point is that there's no survivors, you're the only four, you're fighting a thing. But realistically speaking, of course there are other survivors out there. You're not the only four humans left on Earth, considering the fact that every single time you finish a campaign, you're almost always rescued by someone. So if that's the case, survivors do exist out there. And that led to the creation of all these writings on the wall. And I must say, it is very fun to see what some people have to say about certain things. Especially when it's just like saying that a company sucks or like someone sucks or maybe some reference to something that either I don't get or they're hilarious and I get it. Or at one point where someone's basically talking about like a band that is like really cool and saying RIP to them. But the moment they're given the idea, even the, the slight thought that they were able to get out because they had a chopper, everyone starts basically being like, oh, they have money, they're terrible. <laughs> But through all of this, you might be wondering, these are on the wall in every single safe room you go into. I'm gonna see them. But that's the thing. Are you really? I mean, you're probably just concentrating on staying alive and focusing on readying up your gear and getting going again. Most people, or at least a good chunk of people, just kind of skip by these. Or at least the mass majority of these texts. You might see one or two pieces, but it's honestly interesting to me personally that they exist at all. As I said, they didn't have to, and they're super cool that they did. But what other examples exist in the more modern, modern era? Because 2009, where when this game came out, is not really what people would call modern nowadays. 
So let's go back to 2017, which is kind of modern. Let's see what they got. Cuphead, one of my absolute favorite games of all time. I love boss games, I love bosses in games. My favorite part of basically any game, so understandably, I love this game. Point is, is that this game has some very cool, what you would call, pointless extras. Now I could bring up the whole secret boss that exists on the DLC island, and the broken relic that comes with it, but technically speaking, those two are unlockables. Although, they're given big hints to how you unlock them. However, one area that you may not know about is actually the quartet that exists on the second island. These three little guys are very sad when you first encounter them, but you can find their fourth little guy hidden somewhere on the island. This isn't anything too spectacular on its own, and that's fine because technically speaking it is essentially a side quest that you may or may not ever care about again. But what makes this go the extra mile is that they didn't just basically go, thanks you found him, we did it, we're all together again, once you actually do find him. No, they give you an entire song, an original song, specifically for this encounter. And that is the extra we're looking at. Because while it may not be as super duper hidden as some of the more retro examples, it is for sure a good chunk of content that had to go a lot of effort to make, just for something that most players may just skip over. Because honestly, I can't remember many playthroughs I saw of this game of people I watched play it, where they actually found the little guy. Because it's kind of stupid how close he is to the thing, and then, like the other guys. And, and so watch this. Okay, so you go up here, you go up there, and uh, there he is. He's right there. It, that's where he normally is. Okay, of course I've already collected him on this save file, but that's where he normally is. It's so close to where you find him and where they are. How did you not find your way back, mate? How did you? <laughs> anyway, still a very interesting example, even if it doesn't quite follow the ideals that I had for the stuff back in the 2000s and before. But I still commend making an entire song just for that. This might actually fall into one of the most well-known examples for this type of category. And honestly, I think what's super cool about it is the fact that I don't know if I've ever actually encountered it because the chances of encountering it are so one, so small, but two, you might not even notice it when you encounter it. So, Minecraft has a tiny little secret hidden feature where randomly on the title screen, the word Minecraft will instead say Minceraft. Why? I don't know, because why not? It's stupid. And that is a perfect example. It's very small. Yes, it's very tiny. And granted, it would have taken like, what, like 10 minutes to do. And it's still something that I want to bring up because it's essentially so tiny and so small that most people will never encounter it even when they encounter it. Because here's the thing. Even if you play Minecraft every single day of your life, you might not ever see it because it's a 1 in 100,000 chance, if I remember the numbers correctly. And even if you got it, you might skip over it completely in your way to the single player or multiplayer menu and completely ignore it. Because the chances of noticing it say Minecraft or Minceraft is so small that it won't register in your brain. And that is beautiful in my mind. <laughs> it had no reason to be made, it had no reason to be done, but it was, and that is is hilarious. This isn't a long example, I know, but the reason why I want to bring this up is because it's one of the very few examples I thought of very quickly when I thought of what's pointless in a video game that's so funny to me that's just there, and this was definitely one of them. But while I've gone over some modern examples, and I know there wasn't too many, but that's because I don't really know of too many to be honest, there is still a category that's humongous, that existed for a very long time and is less seen nowadays, as you'd expect, but still technically falls into this category. That's the cheat code. Cheat codes have been around for a very long time and they are awesome. So let's go and check out some of the coolest stuff that I know about from cheat codes. And of course, you know, the types of cheat codes. Originally when I wanted to do this video, and I wanted to bring up the example of cheat codes, I knew I would use this game specifically because it has a bunch of cool cheat codes you can do by entering your name a certain way, which is definitely one of the biggest examples of how cheat codes are done. I was going to use the examples for stuff like permanent invincibility, or the most powerful weapons forever. 
You know, that kind of stuff. Because that's the kind of cheat codes I knew about. What I did not know about, which actually ends up falling more into the example of the pointless extra, is that you could get outfits for your characters by giving certain names. Or, I guess more specifically, a certain character would get a certain costume. And that is so cool. And you can get some of the stupidest stuff. Like, you can get, like, a schoolgirl outfit for, like, a warrior. Or you can get, like, a waitress costume for another character, which is, once again, really cool. There is a lot of costumes. There's, like, 20 of them. The fact that they went to the trouble of making all these costumes for these characters when they just didn't need to. And by far, the absolute king is the cheat code NUD069, in which the dwarf character gets an outfit that I can't describe. And I know I could describe it, but I feel like if I do, I might just get banned. <laughs> because, um, this game was rated 15, okay? So it's like, it's always like, like people were gonna see this anyway, because it's so well hidden. Like, what the chances you put that as your name? Maybe that's why they made it a 069 instead of E69. Because someone might have accidentally come across it by putting E69 instead. I could see that. That aside, though, there are other costumes that are also super cool. One of my absolute favorite has to go to the Rat Warrior, in which you basically get a big rat in a giant metal costume with a big axe. I wasn't actually planning to originally go through the levels, but I wanted to play a level with this guy and honestly I had a lot of fun. This game is super fun and if you're a fan of Gauntlet, I really hope you've played this game. Trust me, this game is top notch. It is one of the best games ever made. One of my absolute favorites. But when you think of cheat codes, what do you think of? Because I would think of something like a very classic game. Sonic 2 may have some of the coolest stuff in this particular genre that I've ever seen. Because in the options menu on the main menu, you can access a sound test, which is in itself a pretty cool little feature. However, inputting certain codes in a certain order on the sound test gives you access to all sorts of things, including a level select, which allows you, of course, to get to any level in the game whenever you want, or a debug menu which is even cooler. Because to get the debug menu, not only do you need to know the code to get into the actual level select, but then on the level select, it has a sound test that allows you to get another code in to access debug mode, in which you can then basically put down your own objects and obstacles and stuff of like that wherever you want in the stage. And you can mess around with different values and that kind of stuff. And of course, I know a lot of people who, when they were younger, messed around with this for hours, because that's the thing. Once you master a game and you find out about this kind of really cool little feature, of course you're going to spend loads of times doing this. Who wouldn't want to mess around with their favorite stages and add a bunch of obstacles that make it ridiculously difficult so no one can ever get past? I certainly did! Game design be damned! I want to feel the pain! I used to play this game a lot back in the Sega Gems collection. No, that's the wrong version, Sonic Mega Collection Plus. But I actually did need to use Sonic Gems collection because our very next example is in Sonic CD. I'm realizing there's a lot of Sonic in this video. Now I wanted to bring up Sonic CD as its own example because it one has a hidden sound test rather than an open sound test like in Sonic 2 but also because it has some of the most cool stuff. Because this has truly pointless stuff. Because you could make the argument that the only reason the level select and also the debug menu stuff exists is because developers needed to use them to actually make the game. So instead of just deleting them, they just basically add them as secret codes. However, the sound test in Sonic CD features hidden images only accessible by entering the hidden sound test and then putting in a certain code. That's a lot of steps. <laughs> That's a lot of hidden steps. So what kind of examples fall under these hidden sound test pictures? Well, there's one of a very cool looking Sonic who's just laying on the ground, just kind of chilling out. That's always cool to see. Very thin arms. I notice he has very, very thin arms. Almost like the two pixels big, it looks like on the screen, which is kind of weird. I can't unsee it, really, now that I look at it like that. I I I'm just noticing that now. I'm looking at it right now. What is wrong with his arms? They're too thin. <laughs> There's another example of a very, like, Batman-like Sonic. It looks interesting. I, I don't know who uh, wanted to make that, but, I mean, hey, someone had to go to the trouble of making it, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna judge it. Someone had fun making that image and really put detail into Muscle Sonic. Oh, they're just a bit too early. Give about 10 years, buddy. You would have been perfect online. <laughs> 
Next up is one of the most infamous images from this game, being the Fun is Infinite image, with a bunch of Sonics with very weird looking masks on him. Or are those masks, or are those just his actual face? I don't know. A lot of kids probably got scared by this image if they ever saw it. Which I'm sure a couple did. Can't imagine being that one kid who was like, dark in their room, messing around with the sound test that they just figured out, and then this came on the screen. They probably thought they broke the law. <laughs> Following that, however, we have a very cool image of uh, DJ Sonic with Eggman back there just vibing on his DJ system. Metal Sonic, of course, who was introduced in this game, hanging out on the side over there. Maybe, is it, maybe it looks to me like he's holding a microphone. Maybe they're getting ready to rap battle. I could see it. I could see Sonic and Metal Sonic rap battling. Someone's probably made that online. I don't know. I'll have to look up that. Why would I look up that? I don't want to look up that. <laughs> Images aside, there's also a hidden special stage level, which is also really cool because once again, new content only accessible via this area. Original content like this is always what makes it interesting about these type of things because it's some things that someone had to go out of their way to make that most people don't see and that's always the coolest part of this type of thing. And before we finish off, I want to bring up one more example from a game that I know of that's a very unknown game because it's made by one person and I want to show how cool that game is anyway, but also the example inside of it. Last up is Scoop Kick. Now this game is kind of unknown, of course, but the thing is about this, it does have an example of the whole cheat code thing, right? And it's really cool how it's done. So this game was actually made by a person called Raimani, that's how they go online, and they were actually the creator of Rayman Redemption, a full Rayman 1 remake. But this game stands on its own merit anyway. It's super fun, I have played it to full completion, and it's really, really cool. Okay, so somewhere there is a hidden room which allows you to enter cheat codes. And here's the thing, those cheat codes are not found in the game and the only way you would know them is by trying different combinations out there might be cheat codes I have never ever found nor ever will but I have seen a couple well you might say that the actual room itself doesn't belong on the list because of the fact that it actually links to a achievement you can say the cheat codes themselves lead to this list because of the fact that they are not accessible in the game itself. You have to know the code to put in. And to be honest, I don't know most of them. And I hope one day I can figure them out or at least be told them because then I get to have new content for this game that I never knew about. But I won't go too long on this specific example simply because of the fact that I want people to check this game out. Trust me, it is super fun. It is a great time. If you like burger time, especially from the uh, from the arcade days, check this out. Like this, this is a reborn burger time essentially in, 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 a, in its own unique way though it still stands its own merit with unique characters and unique things unlockables extras bonus content please check it out i promise you you have a good time all that to the side though that's it that's all the examples so what now what's in the future I wanted to take a moment to talk to any potential indie devs that might be watching who are thinking about putting their own pointless extra into their game. Just so I can give a very clear explanation, I know we've been talking about the whole video, but we did say at the beginning that stuff had to be substantial and I didn't always show substantial examples. I was more showing some easter eggs with stuff like Sonic Heroes with their skins, where it's sizable, it's nice and it's a simple feature, but it's, it's not super definable. Or Minceraft, where they had only one tiny little thing that was changed, and you could really think that's just a small easter egg. And you'd be right. Because if I had to try and explain exactly what a pointless extra is, with on no uncertain terms, I would say it's a huge easter egg that's usually pretty interactable, that is not hidden via some unlockable, or something that is very much in the open. Now, I know we discussed about the fact that, you know, not everyone can spend the time making a thing like this in their games because no one has the time for that kind of stuff. Bigger developers, smaller developers, whatever the reason. But if you can, I would love to see it. Or maybe you want to keep it hidden for someone to find one day. That's perfectly fine too. All that really matters is that you have fun making this pointless type of extra. Maybe I'll be able to make Pong one day in one of my games hidden somewhere because that Rayman 2 example always gets me with just how stupidly funny it is and how it always reuses assets. And sometimes they do go above and beyond with Gauntlet Dark Legacy where they added a bunch of different skins where it's completely unique to just the skins and, and, and those are brand new things made just for the funny easter eggs. 
Regardless of all that, no matter what you decide to do, or if you're not an indie dev and you're just enjoying this video, let's wrap things up with just a final message towards the end. Honestly, my biggest hope for all of this is the fact that, like, I just hope people will start putting this stuff in their games again. As I said earlier, if you have any examples of this type of genre, do tell me. Because I really want to know. I really want to know what people know about this type of stuff that I don't. On top of that, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope at least one of these things was brand new to you. If not, well, hey, you probably know more than I do anyway. Uh, last time I made a video, it actually did very well, and I'm very pleased with that. I was not expecting that at all, but hopefully people like this one too. And this time I have left uh, a link to the, the Discord in my description, because last time someone told me that it was very hard to find. So hopefully now it's a bit easier for everyone <laughs> if they want to join the Discord. Obviously, uh, Vexation, Handcrafted Hell, my upcoming game this year. Check it out in the description if you want to see that as well. And uh, yeah, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed the show.